right, so check this out. I've been debating about whether to post this or not, but I finally decided that it's been long enough for me to talk about it. This happened to me and my mom a few months ago, back in October. It happened in a very rural part of New Hampshire, like a side road on a side road type of neighborhood. It was pouring out as it had been raining for pretty much the whole day. My mom had just gotten back from down the street in my sister's car and I was on the couch in the living room when suddenly I heard the doorbell ring. Our front door has a big glass pane in the front so we can look out from the inside and, well, someone can also look in from the outside. Through this window pane, I see a man. I didn't get a great look at him as I didn't have my long distance glasses on. The man noticed that I had seen him and waved as if trying to be friendly. For the rest of this post, I will refer to him as Poncho Man. I got up and thought about opening the door for Poncho Man, but I relented as I couldn't properly see who it was. I didn't want to let a stranger into the house. Instead, I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom where my mom was getting ready for work. She asked what was up and I explained to her that a man in a poncho was outside our door and wanted to talk to us. She went white as a ghost. Immediately, she stopped getting ready, closed and locked the bedroom door and started checking the windows to make sure they were locked too. I asked her what was going on. My mom explained that as she was driving home, she saw a poncho man. He had been standing motionless on the side of the main street. As soon as my mom turned down our road, he started to walk, presumably to follow her. She said the encounter was weird but thought nothing more of it. Why would someone be out in the pouring rain down a back road in the afternoon? It was like he was waiting for something. I started to panic as well. My mom called my aunt, they're like best friends, and asked what she should do. My aunt told her to call the police immediately and so we did. We proceeded to pace around the bedroom, frantically looking out of the windows to see if we could see Poncho Man. From where the bedroom was angled, it was impossible to look at the front porch and see if he was still there, but we were desperate for anything. After what felt like hours, we finally saw a police car pull up. We carefully unlocked the door and went down to let the officer in. We explained what we saw and he agreed to do a scan around the neighborhood. As he left, I noticed there was something on the doorknob. I took it off and it was a political ad for a candidate that was running for office. Now, it's possible that Pancho Man was just campaigning for the candidate, but there's a lot of holes in that story. It was pouring rain outside, so why would you go door to door? And why would you go that route in such a rural neighborhood? The houses are so far apart you'd barely make a dent on foot. The time doesn't make sense either. Sure, me and my mom were home, but it was about four in the afternoon. Most people would still be at work, so you'd probably get no response from knocking anyway. Eventually, the officer returned. He had found the guy down the road and said he had questioned him. Pancho Man was able to ID himself and he claimed that he was a political campaigner and was just knocking on doors for that exact reason. When probed further, conveniently enough, Pancho Man couldn't provide any other door signs as the one he had left on our house was the last one. That makes the campaign story even more absurd. Our house is in the middle of the street. It's not like we were the last by any means, so why wouldn't you bring enough for the whole street? Even the officer pointed this out to us and said that it was unusual behavior. Although the officer was suspicious of him, there wasn't anything he could really do about it, as there was no way to prove intent. He told us to be alert and to not hesitate to call if Poncho Man returns. Well, fast forward a few weeks and I start noticing that a police car seems to be permanently stationed down the road from us. It's about a three minute drive. 
I got curious and I asked my mom about it. She said that there were multiple break-ins into the houses down the road and the police were doing a sort of sting operation. The poncho man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated, but considering how poncho man acted, I have a sinking feeling that they're actually connected. Thankfully, for the past few months, we've heard and seen nothing of poncho man. We got a new doorbell system with a camera, and the police left the area where they were doing the sting. I hope that this whole situation is over and done with, and that I never have to meet Poncho Man. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't have a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car, plus the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike. He didn't have a profile picture or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh wow, I guess I'm this person's first customer ever. But then, a full 30 minutes passes with no driver movement on the app and at this point, I think maybe something's glitching out or maybe he's stuck. I contact support via the chat option and they ended up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver and they're also on a bike and they also don't have a profile picture and they have no prior deliveries either. This driver's name was Lori. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I messaged them myself to say, hey, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but they never responded. All this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing issues, and there were none that I can find, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Same deal, they always tried to contact the driver with no response. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, and no prior deliveries. Only this time, his name is Robert. And before I can react and go about canceling the order at this point because I'm just tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, I have your food. What's your phone number? And I respond right away with, ah, I'm not super comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded again with, what's your number? I'll be there in 10. How old are you? And at this point, the alarm bells are going off and I contact support immediately to have the order canceled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team who informs me that the order has been canceled. I'll be refunded and started taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the info she needs, I'm starting to calm down thinking that this was just some creep or something and that's when I hear a man's voice at the front door. Miss Metal Gear 42069, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the Uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and goes, Is that him? We canceled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open, but the metal screen door was closed and locked, but still allowed us to see each other. And I got a look at him. And when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling 
to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to please leave because he's making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. And at this point, he starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay and the man is still shouting. So basically, I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and I hurriedly closed the heavy door and I locked it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that and back up the sidewalk and for a moment, I thought he shoved off so I finished my conversation with the uber safety woman so she could submit the report. And once she submitted it, I called the police and I told them what happened. Now, they weren't incredibly helpful at first since he didn't actually break in or put his hands on me, and they told me that if he came back to call again, and they would send an officer out. I did end up having to call them again and give a full report, plus a description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man that I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat, and I guess they just sat there, staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So, basically, this was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone has ever experienced anything like this because, honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up and I'll be avoiding these delivery apps for quite a while. So, to the strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for my personal information and then proceeded to try and break in, let's not meet. It's the mid-1990s on a rural road in South Mississippi. It was springtime, just a few months before we were supposed to graduate high school and leave everything we knew behind. My best friend's dad owned a used car dealership. The previous week, we had gotten a small, sporty Mazda convertible. His dad liked to give his new cars a week or so of running around to make sure he wasn't selling any lemons. So he gave us the keys and sent us off to give it a test drive around the rural back roads of the Pine Belt with heartfelt promises from both of us that we would be safe and definitely not speed or drive irresponsibly. A promise we kept to the next intersection before zooming out of sight. We had been driving around for about an hour before coming back to this one section of two-lane highway that ran through a floodplain for a small muddy water creek. The road was on an embankment so it wouldn't flood every time it rained, so there was a steep 15-foot high drop-off on either side of the road. I mean, there's no pulling over to the side of the road if you were to break down on this section of roadway. The stretch that we were on was straight but had a small hill that crested at about the halfway mark of this half mile or so of asphalt. We had been enjoying our freedom and broken promises to his dad and this particular moment was no different. We quickly ran up to a car that was very likely going the speed limit but they were driving way too slow for us and that little Mazda. My friend and I looked at each other with a grin. He downshifted and gave it plenty of gas, eager to leave the slower car in our dust. As we crested the hill, a blur of metal appeared in our lane, barreling towards us at an alarming speed. We weren't even a hundred feet from the other car coming straight at us. I distinctly remember the driver in that car bracing himself, his eyes wide, knowing his options for avoiding a collision were zero to none. My best friend and I both yelled, oh shit, 
In unison, as I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the inevitable collision, there's no way that we could have missed that car. I saw the driver's eyes. He was so close. Impact was inevitable. Except the sickening explosion of metal crunching against metal at high speed never came. I opened my eyes and I looked to my left. I saw my friend's arm nonchalantly resting on the door, his mouth open as he sang along to the gin blossoms follow you down. It was a beautiful day. The roof was down, the radio was blaring, and there wasn't a car in sight. Not even the one that we attempted to pass. I blinked a few times. I looked again to make sure that I was believing what I was seeing. Not wanting to hear my friend gloat about how awesome of a driver he is, I didn't ask him how he avoided the other car. He didn't even seem phased by it. I'm a skeptical man, but that incident was one of two things in my life that I simply cannot explain. In our 30s, when we happened to find ourselves in the same town one evening, we met up for beers, and between asking about our careers and our families, I brought up the incident. I said, do you remember that time that your dad gave us the Mazda to drive around and how we almost hit that car? He thought about it for a second and I saw the blood drain from his face. Holy shit, he said, I do remember that. What happened? I told him I didn't know, but I had hoped that he would have filled in the blanks for me. I felt an ice cold chill race up my spine. This past year, he brought his family to my town for a vacation. They came to my house for dinner and I wanted to tell our wives the story and have him tell his side of it all. This time, my friend seemed to have no recollection of it, as if his mind had completely erased the experience. Even when I reminded him of our previous conversations about it, he looked at me with a blank stare, as if he had never heard the story before. And so, the mystery of that near accident on the back roads of Mississippi remains unsolved, a strange and inexplicable memory that haunts me to this day. A mystery that seems to get stranger and stranger as the years go on. I have a young cat who's really smart and really naughty. She's allowed outside during the day, but she's also afraid of birds, <laughs> so she prefers it if me or my partner are outside with her. However, she really wants to be out at night, like very badly and she knows she's not allowed. She used to try to bolt if the door was open, even for a second, but we wised up to her and now she tries to be stealthy. It doesn't work on me because I've got her number, but my partner can be oblivious sometimes and she'll take the opportunity to slip out. I like to read, smoke, and drink on the back deck at night and there's a huge glass paneled door that she can jealously watch me through. Sometimes she stays by the door the entire time, especially when the moths are out, but sometimes she gets bored and goes to her spot on the couch. Well, one night, I'm out reading and drinking and I hear a soft thump on the deck. I look up and there she is, that little rat. I start scolding her for being out at night, assuming my partner accidentally let her out, and she ignores me doing her usual routine of standing up on her haunches and smelling this particular spot on the wall. It's an unusual posture and it looks really funny and distinct. As I'm still scolding her, she meanders under the table just out of my reach. I look under, but she seems to have disappeared into the shadows. I know she'll eventually want to come back in, so I don't pursue her. I mean, that just makes her stay out anyway. So I get up and I go in to refill my drink and to yell at my partner. And what do I see? She's in her spot on the couch, completely passed out asleep. I start yelling for my partner and she wakes up, slightly looking at me through drowsy eyes. I saw her outside less than two minutes ago and my partner said that they hadn't gone out at all recently. 
I started to wonder if there was a cat who just looked like her, but she's so distinct, down to her extra hangy primordial pouch and silly little quirks, and clearly the cat outside knew me and was comfortable with me. We also don't have many strays around here because we border the wilderness and they can't survive. I know all of my neighbor's cats and they definitely don't look or act like mine. Here's the TLDR. I saw my cat outside, but when I went inside, she was sleeping on the couch. Was she astral projecting? Was I seeing into the future or the past? Or does my cat have a doppelganger? That's a duplicate. There's a place in Nova Scotia known locally as Little Girl's Grave. It's a gravestone of a young girl named Catherine McIntosh. She died of an illness and was originally buried in McLennan Cemetery. However, due to a dispute with a neighbor, her body was dug up and moved to the side of Greenvale Road in front of the family farm. One night, I went with two friends to visit the gravestone. It was a dark and foggy night, driving down the eerie, winding dirt road until we came upon the location. We brought a toy to leave at the gravestone. The local lore surrounding the site says to leave a toy for her and to never take a toy away. It wasn't until we left and began driving down the dirt road that we had a paranormal experience. We noticed on the front windshield in the condensation a small child's footprint on the glass. It was so detailed and human-like. It scared us quite a bit, to say the least. One of the friends that I had visited the gravesite with, we worked at the same restaurant at the time. Well, a few days after we had visited the site, we were working together and we both heard something truly bizarre. It was the sound of a child laughing, very faintly. We both stared at each other in disbelief and we had no idea where the sound was coming from whatsoever as there was no one around except just the two of us. Not long after this, we had a falling out and we haven't spoken to each other since 2013. This is one of the only paranormal experiences that I've encountered in my life. If anyone who listens to this has had any similar experiences at this gravestone, please share. Thank you for listening to my story, and may you all have a good evening. When I was a child, I had two separate experiences that may have been supernatural or may have simply been my mind playing tricks on me. However, when I was about 18 or 19, I experienced something that was definitely supernatural. On the southern tip of Staten Island, there lies the Conference House and its surrounding park. Up until the early 2000s, there was about a half a dozen houses on parks department grounds that were vacated and demolished so that they could make walking trails and such. An ex-girlfriend of mine has lived in one of these houses with her mother and her sisters. When I would spend the night, I would share the pull-out bed with her in the living room. However, there was one night where it was particularly hot, so we went upstairs and slept in her sister's bedroom since it was cooler in there and they wouldn't be home that night. For whatever reason, I couldn't sleep comfortably at all. I would wake up and just look out towards the window across the room. At around the third time I woke up, I saw something standing between the bed and the window, nearer to the window. I was told this house was haunted and in the year and a half since I started hanging out there with my ex and her sisters, I had never really seen anything. So this one night, I see standing near a window a silhouette of a human figure. It was just standing there. Even though the room was dark, there was still enough moonlight illuminating the room, yet what I saw was pitch black. I'm talking blacker than the blackest black, times infinity. I wasn't able to make out any facial distinctions. It was like it was devoid of anything human. 
It really was just a black silhouette, and it was terrifying. After staring at this entity for what seemed like forever, or just three seconds, I woke up my then-girlfriend. I asked if she was seeing what I was seeing, and she did. I quickly asked what we should do, and she said we should go downstairs, to which all I could say was, okay. Luckily, the door to the hallway was about two feet away from the bed on her side. After she got up, I quickly followed. Instead of getting up on my side, which would have placed me between the foot of the bed and the entity, I rolled across the bed and hurried my way out, never looking back. That was the one and only time I ever experienced anything in that house, but that moment has stayed with me for nearly 20 years. Even though those houses were demolished in the early 2000s, I don't dare walk down that block at night. I was homeless in Long Beach, California in 1980 at 16 years old because my mom was in federal prison and my dad lived in Texas. I was staying in cars and garages. I was hitchhiking from downtown to Belmont Shores one day and was given a ride by a dude who was kind of strange, but I wasn't worried. I was already a hard drug user and I had been arrested for 25 pounds of marijuana in Huntington Beach, but that's another story. I was picked up by this dude and as we drove down Ocean Boulevard, he said to me, I have to make a short detour and pick up some Valiums. I said okay and we turned onto Coronado Street and drove a few blocks up the street. He parked in front of a small apartment building and said, I'll be right back. I was waiting in the car and he came from the apartment to the car. He said his cousin had locked the Valiums in a safe and he had paged him and was waiting for him to call him with the combo. He asked if I wanted to come up and smoke. I was like, okay, because I was a pothead. I followed him upstairs and entered the apartment. I sat down on the couch and immediately scanned the room for weapons because he was kind of strange. I mean, Long Beach is full of kind of strange people anyway. I saw a pair of scissors and some other stuff scattered around the apartment. It was fairly clean and well kept. As I'm looking around, he reaches under the couch for what I thought was a weed tray. He says, hey, you ever seen one of these? And as I look at what's in his hands, it's a pair of flex cuffs, and he says, try them on, and then he attacks me. He grabs my wrists and pulls out a can of mace and sprays me right in the face. He's able to get the zip tie around my wrists, but I pulled one hand out as he tightened it. I jumped up as we were fighting and I got to the scissors. I grabbed the scissors and he got me in a bear hug from behind. I stabbed him in the face as he was trying to pin my arms. I'm fighting for my life and I stabbed as hard as I could. His grip moved up and pinned my arms and began choking me from behind. I wasn't able to breathe and I thought I was going to die. So I went limp and acted like I was done. He dropped me to the floor and dragged me to the bathroom by my arm. He opened the bathroom door and turned on the sink water and said, wash your face, and left me standing there. I immediately jumped onto the rim of the bathtub and he stuck his arm in the door holding a towel. I was going to jump out of a second story window. When I saw his arm sticking through the door, my body blocked the door and he fell back and I jumped over him. We ran to the front door. I got to the front door and to my horror, I saw that it was a key lock on the inside. I grabbed the doorknob and turned and it opened. I ran outside and began beating on every upstairs door of that building. It was like 12 units, so I ran and I yelled, Police! Police! Call the police! I ran downstairs and there were two guys tossing a football in the street. They must have tripped out because I was freaking out and I had a zip tie around my wrist. They asked me what was going on and I told them what happened. Now, 
So I was explaining what happened and they cut the zip tie off and the weirdo tried to come out and leave. The guys that were now helping me told the dude that the cops are on the way and that you ain't going nowhere. I heard the sirens and three police cars came with lights and sirens blazing. The police asked me what happened and I explained what happened. They went up to his apartment and came down and told me I had to go up to the apartment, but I didn't want to go back in there. He told the police I tried to rob him and stabbed him in the face. He said he wasn't gay and the police looked around and found some gay stuff and they had the zip tie that was cut off my wrists. They took me outside and explained because I was a juvenile that my parents would also have to come to the station to press charges. They told me that if they arrested him, I would be coming also. I said I refused to press charges because I didn't want my parents involved. And they left and I went on my merry way. My mom got out of the feds and I moved to Texas for five years. I came back and my mom and sister had bought a house almost directly across the street from the apartment where this happened. My sister said she wanted to introduce me to her new husband and I almost had a heart attack. It was the dude tossing the football that day and he said, where do I know you from? I was like, hey, you remember the kid with the zip tie, right? And he's like, no freaking way, man. It's crazy. This happened when I was in high school. It was a long time ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. And I don't remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than how I remembered it. There was a 17-year-old female working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime. A man comes in. He's short, overweight. He's balding. He's in his 40s. Generally creepy. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend. So I offer a bouquet. I mean, obviously it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing as he came into a flower shop. Then he goes into detail about how he hit her and asks me if I think he was right to do so. This was long ago, so I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing and asks when I get off of work. I dodge the question and he eventually leaves. Then nothing for six months. And then right before Valentine's Day, he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark and from the outside, it looked like I was working alone because my coworker, who was about a 40-year-old female at the time, was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something just isn't right, and, well, everything felt not right. I then noticed that he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious that he wanted it to be seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my coworker and said, he has a gun, and I handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she should call the police. I shook my head no as I felt like it would just escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and then took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends maybe 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop. In retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for a pickup on Valentine's Day which gives me his name and info for the police report that I am sure as hell about to file. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through as 
though looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with a Valentine's card, and he replies, no, I didn't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves, and we quickly lock the door and watch him just sit in his truck outside. We were not going to exit the shop until he was finally gone. Eventually, he pulls out of his parking spot and then moves to another spot further away and just continues to sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom, crying, and she called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what had happened, and she told her mom. Her mom happened to work with the man and informed security at their job. She said he was very weird, very creepy, and that he liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job, it's a large company with government contracts and things having to deal with tech and security. Well, they pulled him into their office and they questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver, and the police were pissed that his company made contact with him about it before they did. And he successfully dodged the cops multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit that job, which was devastating because I loved it there. But in retrospect, it was totally the right call. The dude came in on Valentine's Day and picked up his order. I never saw him again. Me and my best friend in college went from Alabama to Atlanta, Georgia, um, a bunch of times just to shop, go to Six Flags, eat, whatever, but one time we were coming back super late, like after midnight, and once you're past noon in Georgia on I-85 going towards Alabama, there's a good stretch of nothing, but we got hungry and got off because the interstate sign said there was a Wendy's. We turned left, as the sign said, and went across the bridge and didn't see a Wendy's, but we kept driving. We were nearly 20 minutes down the road, talking, and realized there was no restaurant. The road we were on bent to the right, and was a T-intersection stop sign. There was another interstate sign saying I-85 to the right. We said, huh, okay and turned right and thought that we would just go back to the interstate and go up to another exit to find food. After five minutes down the road though, there was an empty gas station and the Wendy's, it was open. We thought, okay, well, that was a ways to get there from the interstate 25 minutes ago, but whatever. We also needed gas, so we got gas first. Another vehicle pulls up at the pump across from us and the old guy gets out. He freezes and stares silently like a horror movie at me pumping gas. He left before me which seemed quick and my soul shivered but I finished and we went into the Wendy's drive through The server at the speaker and window sounded like a tired robot and also stared at us blankly like a zombie without blinking. We waited and got our food and couldn't wait to leave. Just before driving off, I look at the gas station again and the same creepy man is there, in the same spot staring at us in the Wendy's line completely silent and still. We turned right quickly on that same road going the same direction towards where it said the interstate would be. We seemed to drive longer than we thought without the interstate popping up and, well, we decided just to turn around and retrace our drive. We went back the opposite direction looking for the Wendy so that we knew about how far the left turn would be, but before you know it, there was the left turn with no gas station and no Wendy's. We turned left anyway and went back to the interstate just like we came and we ate our ghost Wendy's in silence halfway home 
before having the gumption to ask each other if that really just happened. 